May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So the disciples are arguing amongst themselves who's the greatest. I guess they never listened to Muhammad Ali, huh? <laughs> He's the greatest, right? Um, I don't know what they're arguing about. We don't know. Maybe they were arguing about who saw the best miracle, the greatest miracle. Maybe they're arguing about who made the greatest sacrifice to come and follow Jesus. Maybe they're arguing about who, who spent the most time with Jesus. Um, we don't know what that was all about, but they were uh, wondering who was the greatest. Um, and it's not uh, difficult for us to connect with that in our culture. As I talked to the kids, uh, what Harlan talked about was uh, our culture is uh, full of uh, you know, the best. We're trying to figure out who's the best college football team. Um, NASCAR is at the point where they're trying to figure out who the best driver is. It's down to the last, what, eight weeks or eight races or something like that. <clears throat> um, we we, we want to know who, who, who got the most uh, Olympic medals. Um, and um, I'm guilty of that myself. I mean, I, I look every morning in the pages and see if the Cubs won or lost. And, Yep. How close Milwaukee is to catching them and uh, those darn old Cardinals. Just kidding. I know. Well, there might be some Cardinal fans here, so I better be careful. Right? Um, so it's uh, it, it, it's just in our wrong. culture to uh, argue about that and want to know who's the greatest. And um, Jesus hears what they're saying, and he get, he says, "Come and sit down and let's talk about this." Um, maybe the reason that they were talking about who's the greatest is because they didn't want to deal with that first part of the scripture when Jesus says uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to suffer I'll be killed and I'll be raised again I mean this is the second time in the Gospel of Mark that he says this and uh, you know how it is if you um, if, if you don't want to acknowledge something you just don't talk about it right? you hope it goes away I remember when I was a child um, I needed a sleeping bag for my scout troop and there, it, was, it was $20 and um, my dad said he would loan me the money, but I had to pay him back a dollar every week for my paper out money for 20 weeks. Well, after, I was pretty good for three or four weeks. <laughs> then I, I started skipping payments, and I was hoping dad would forget, because, you know, he was older, and bless his soul, he can't remember all that. <laughs> well, I let it slip for four weeks, and then dad came knocking. He said, son, you're behind in your payments. And I go, oh, yes, right. Uh, he says, you need to catch up. I'm not letting you off this. So I learned something about paying back. and uh, It was a good lesson for me. Dad didn't forget. <laughs> um, so, so the disciples are, have heard Jesus say this, and they don't want, and it says they didn't ask him any questions about it. I wish they would have. Uh, they didn't, and then they start talking about who's the greatest. It's best to switch the conversation. Maybe if we don't talk about that, Jesus will forget about it, because it sounds like there's quite a sacrifice going on here. And if we're his followers, is this going to be the future of what we're doing? Is this why we follow this guy? To be killed and to suffer and to raise again? Um, so Jesus gathers them together. And anytime you see the Bible or Jesus or anybody says, well, let's sit down, let's talk about this. You know, that some, there's going to be a lesson for this. And uh, Jesus says, um, the first are going to be last, and the last are going to be first, which is a complete reversal. It's a paradox. If you remember last week, though, he's good at this. He said, if you want to save your soul, you need to lose it. Those who lose their life will save it. And now he's at another paradox, another reversal. If you want to be first, you've got to be last. If you want to be last, you've got to be first. And I can just see the disciples scratching their head and uh, saying, maybe, Jesus, no wonder we didn't ask you anything because you keep pulling this stuff on us. Um, so what's Jesus talking about? And then I thought it was interesting. He, he does a children's sermon, right? He brings a, grabs a child. He brings a child into the center of it. Sometimes children's sermons, we have little objects that we uh, help the kids see things better. So he brings this child, and he says, um, if you want to follow me, and if you want to know what it means to be last, and to be a servant, 
when you quit talking about who's the greatest, then here's what you need to focus on, this child. Now, it's good to know that children in those days were like non-entities. Um, they existed, but they weren't producing anything, so they weren't as popular as adults. They were low on the pecking order. My aunt had hens that she kept in the chicken house. I hated to go in there and get the eggs because the, the, the hens would not only peck at me, but I think they pecked at each other. I think there was a pecking order in the hen house. <laughs> and I was the bottom, as a child, I was the bottom on the pecking order. Well, this child in this culture that Jesus is in, the children are at the bottom of the pecking order. Jesus brings a child into the center. Jesus does not bring Caesar into the center. He doesn't even bring himself into the center. He's certainly not going to bring the disciples in because they don't even want to talk. And they're arguing about who's the greatest. So those that are reading this passage or those that saw Jesus do this got to scratch their head and say, this child is the face of God? Um, that's amazing to them. It's another reverse. So in order to try to understand this a little bit better, we can ask ourselves, well, what is it the children have that we don't have? One thing they have is a, a great imagination. Children can think outside the box a lot better than we old adults can, or elderly adults. Um, I was a middle school principal, and I had grades six through eight, and I had a sixth grade boy who could not get to school on time. Uh, the parents left early for work. Both parents left early. It was up to the older sister to get the kid up. They didn't like each other, of course. And so this child would not get up and get to school on time. We tried everything. The parents had four or five alarm clocks. They called from work. They pleaded with their daughter to get this kid up and get him to school. We started giving him detention. <laughs> no matter what we did to this kid, he could not get to school on time. So finally, I was getting frustrated and angry and nothing worked for this kid. I think we could have cut off his right arm and he still wouldn't have, or threatened it. He, was still, he just couldn't get up. So I asked him, I said to him, um, help me understand, maybe you have an answer to this. What do you think we should do to solve this problem? So I asked him the question. And you could tell that he'd been thinking about this quite a bit because he's kind of scooted up on the edge of his desk, or on the edge of the seat. He said, oh, Mr. Kuhn, I'm glad you asked me. He says, you know what you need to do? You need to start school two hours later. <laughs> he, was, he was serious, man. And uh, I reacted like you did. And he said, no, 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 really. He says, if, if you start school two hours later, you'll be a hero. Every kid in this building will love you. You'll be a hero. And I said, okay, well, first of all, 99% of the kids are making it on time. You're the only ones having a hard time. And you want us to switch everything for you? Yeah, that's a good idea. And uh, I said, well, you know, um, this would include the whole school system. I, can, I just can't have the middle school kids coming two hours late. We got, it'd be new bus routes and everything. And he said, let's go to the school board and talk about it. I said, just you and, you and me, Mr. Coon, we can go to the school board and talk about this. And I said, you know, it's a great idea, but I don't think it's going to work. I, can't, I don't have the power to do all of that. And uh, I said, why don't you just try a little harder to get here on time? Two weeks later, I'm reading a journal, the middle school journal. And there's an article in there by, a, by a, someone with a great reputation. And the article was about, we need to start school later for early adolescent kids. And I about fell out of my chair. <laughs> this was like 20 years ago. And uh, I couldn't help myself, so I, I, I took the article, and I went and I found the kid, pulled him out of class. And I said, you won't believe this article that I just read. And I gave it to him, and he read it, and he just looked and just beamed. He was smiling from face to face. He says, hey, I'm an expert. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of why people haven't been asking me questions since then. Um, so I ate some curl that morning, but I wanted him to be reinforced with his ability to think. And I think that's something children do. They think outside the box. 
Children also are very honest and blunt. They're very honest. I had another child named Marcy. Uh, when I was at the Trinity United Methodist Church, we had a, a four-week summer school for some children. At the end of that, we told the kids that if they wanted to, on Wednesday nights, they could come back to the church during the school year, and my wife Patty and I would help them with their homework. I said, we're not going to do it for you, but we'll help you with it. Marcy came. Now, Marcy is a uh, seventh grader, and uh, she told me that her goal in life was to be Beyonce. <laughs> that was her goal in life. Well, she, she, uh, she didn't look like Beyonce. She didn't have the body type of Beyonce, and um, she could kind of sing. So she had some pretty high lofty goals. She knew that she had to, to get into school to, uh, to do this, to finish this, make this career. So she came on Wednesday nights to do the homework. And I always started with a scripture and a Bible study and a prayer before they started their homework. One night I was reading from Isaiah chapter 11, and that's the one about the peaceable kingdom. And there's these predator prey pairs. Um, there's like the, uh, the wolf will lie with the lamb and the cow with the bear and all these opposites, predator prey things, you know. And I started to read this and after each pair, Marcy said, without any, pro I didn't provoke this at all. She just says, it ain't gonna happen. <laughs> I'd read the next predator prey and she'd say, it ain't gonna happen. I didn't stop, I just kept reading. And after each one, it was like Sunday morning in worship. She was doing a call to worship kind of a negative one, but I'd read it and she'd say, it ain't gonna happen. So I went through, I think there's like four pairs of those in that scripture. And I stopped and I said, after we finished, I said, Marcy, what's going on here? And she says, none of that's true. There's no way a wolf's gonna lie down with the lamb. The wolf will eat the lamb, grab the food. And I said, well, th this is sort of a, a vision. It's a, it's a metaphor of what God's kingdom should be. She says, I don't care. It just ain't gonna happen. It's not gonna work. <laughs> she said, another thing about this is that my dad's in prison and my mother keeps saying he's gonna get out of prison and I go visit him and that ain't gonna happen. He's never gonna get out of prison. I'm never gonna have my dad. And she said, another thing, I have kids teasing me at school, and they knock the books out of my hands. And no matter who I talk to, principal or teacher, it still happens. It happens every day I go to school. They knock the books out of my hands. And she says, I'm trying to lose weight. I want to be like Beyonce. And all I do is gain weight. So it ain't going to happen. Her world was a world of reality. And no matter what kind of a spin I put on it, she was living this reality. And she had a hard time making the leap from what she was experiencing to what the Bible was presenting. Children can be very honest. They can be very imaginative, as the first child and maybe that's why Jesus put those kids, the child in the middle. Where do you see God? I'll tell you what, you can see God if you go to the border and to the detention centers and you see the kids that are being held there. You can see God if you have a child that's nervous and suffering from depression. It's amazing in our culture, the number of children suffering from depression at an early age. You'll see God with that child. You'll see God in a child who comes to school and is nervous and afraid to go to school because of school shootings. That's where you'll see the face of God. You'll see God in the children that come to this place on Wednesday afternoons. Now I know they're pretty rambunctious. And you might say to yourself, well, if that's God, I'm not sure I want to deal with this. And I found out the other day that the numbers are increasing, that uh, they're up to 16 children. So 
So it's like three times the number that they had last year. That's great. It Praise great. God. But we also need help. We need some more bodies. And if you'd like to help, uh, Julie's having a meeting Tuesday afternoon at 2 o'clock. Um, and you can come and join us and help us as we deal with this phenomenon. There's also more people eating on Wednesday nights. Somebody told me they counted, it's up near 60 people eating Wednesday nights. That's great. So we need help. We need help. I left the Des Moines area for about five or six years. I came back and I was at a restaurant. I was one of the high restaurants. And I, was, I opened up the Des Moines Register and there's always a section there, a neighborhood section, you know. And I was in Windsor Heights. So I'm not sure what's, what the paper was called, but it was the Windsor Heights area. And I opened up the paper and I looked at the front page and there was a picture of Marcy. Um, she was a senior and she was gonna graduate from Roosevelt High School. And she had earned a scholarship to go to college. And she was volunteering her time at the uh, uh, library by Evelyn Davis, um, that library. And there's a little piece in there, just a half a sentence that she said she was grateful for the lessons she had at the Trinity United Methodist Church. Felt good to read that. <laughs> you know? um, so, where are we going to find Jesus? You know, the people that looked in the face of little Lila, uh, Jessica and Samson's daughter, when they looked into her face, they saw God. They saw God. Isn't it amazing? Maybe the reason Jesus took this child was because we have to skip over to the Gospel of Luke. He was born in a manger. He was born into poverty. Isn't that who we adore? That's who we adore. So come, let us adore.